Okay, well, welcome to our lecture on uh, advanced op-amp circuits and applications. Um, I'm, um, uh, yeah, so our, just a quick overview, we'll talk about op-amps and precision measurement applications. We'll go over some types of op-amps and then we'll put, we'll do a couple of like case studies. Um, that's our overview. When we're talking about op amps, well, today our focus is on precision measurement applications or measuring low level signals. Um, you know, this is in contrast to maybe high frequency applications or things like that. That's sort of a lecture for another day. Uh, today, I wanna focus on, you know, measuring things like, really it's, you can group them into high impedance signals and very small signals like very low voltages or low currents for that matter. And, you know, this kind of encompasses most of the struggles that you deal with. You may be dealing with both of those things at once, um, but that's what we're gonna talk about. And of course the op-amp elements we're mainly fighting are things related to bias current and related to offset voltage. So here's an example of an issue where you're measuring a sensor with a very high output impedance of like, you know, 100 mega ohms. If you have a, you have a garden variety op amp, you know, just some general purpose op amp that's going to draw, you know, maybe 10 nanoamps of bias current, um, what kind of error are you expecting? Well, that can be an error of one volt just due to the, the output impedance of the sensor. Uh, similarly, with offset voltage, uh, if you have a signal that's like 500 microvolts or maybe less, and you need to, to add some gain to that circuit um, so that you can actually make that a useful, usable signal, you're looking at an error. If your offset voltage is sort of on the same order of magnitude as the signal you're measuring, uh, like a lot of op amps, you could have even like a couple millivolts of, of offset voltage. This is gonna, this is going to show up as an error in your measurement. And so we really can't deal with these things. Um, so this brings us to talking about, let's talk about op amp types. You know, the, we're mostly interested in the technology that the op amp is use, using on the inside. And one of the big things we care about is that input stage. Um, you know, we don't really care so much about the other sort of gain stages and compensation where what, what dictates like bias current and offset voltage is usually that input stage. So sort of the earliest, uh, I think that's true, that sort of the earliest uh, type of op amp was the bipolar op amp using BJTs. Um, so our, some examples are the, the old LM741 and sort of the industry standard LM324. You know, that's, it's not a great op amp, but it, it exhibits a lot of those sort of, um, well, the LM324 was sort of a big turning point in op amp technology when it came out. Of course, nowadays you can get better op amps, but it's sort of still an industry standard in a lot of ways. And what's nice about, well, maybe what's nice about this, if you will, your bias current is always flowing either into or out of your input. And it's very, cons it's pretty consistent and it's pretty predictable. So you can see I've got two diagrams. These are sort of, you know, usually you'll see a smattering of other components around these. But here are like examples of input stages uh, that you might be looking at. And so, for example, on the left, you have a case where the bias current is flowing into the input. And of course, we know the BJTs are current controlled amplifiers. So you have a pretty consistent current, assuming that your two transistors are very similar. You know, that's, a, that's kind of a big goal that you have with, with op-amp input stages, making the transistors on that input stage, very, very similar. Ideally, they would be like identical. 
and designers try very hard to make them as close to identical as possible. Uh, and identical both in their design and construction, but also their temperature. So you want them to be like on the same die or very close to each other on the die so that they can drift with the same, they, they will drift the same amount with temperature. Um, and you can see at the top, we've got this active current mirror load. Um, and so basically that's ensuring that the current, so you have a current source down the bottom, but the, the current mirror load is ensuring that the current you think about it, it ensures that the current is equal through both of the, the two BJTs, the inputs. And so another case that's pretty much the same circuit, but just built with, well, sort of flipped around and using PNP instead of NPN BJTs, is a case where the bias current is flowing out of the inputs instead of into the inputs. So those are some simplified op-amp input stages. And while we're talking about the LM324, here's a sort of a function, it's functional schematic of its internals. You can see on the left, we have the input stage. And it's pretty much what we saw in our last slide. We're using um, uh, PNP transistors um, as the, the main, differential amplifier stage on the input. And um, you can see they've kind of got this Darlington-esque situation going on. It's not really a Darlington pair, but it's, it's kind of like that, um, where they're just doing that to get lower bias current, even though the bias current is still not great for an LM324. Uh, but in this case, you can see from this schematic that for an LM324, bias current is flowing out of the inputs. So sometimes this is useful to know. Um, so let's talk now about a step into the, the world of field effect transistors. And instead of using BJTs, what if we used uh, field effect transistors, either MOSFETs or JFETs, you know, they both kind of get the job done. And oftentimes, and like I said, you know, the it's really those main transistors on the input stage that we really care about that tells you whether it's like a, you know, a JFET op amp or a C CMOS op amp. Um, and I've, I've drawn the the CMOS example using all um, all FETs, but you don't necessarily have to have that. What we care about is those the what it looks like looking straight into the inputs. So it's worth noting there's no DC current flowing into the gate of a FET. So there's no, so you might be saying, well, there's no DC bias current, but there is bias current, even though it's a very, very small bias current. And that's great. That's great that it's a very small bias current. If it's sufficiently low, I mean, we're talking tens of picoamps or, um, you know, something on the order of tens of picoamps. That's a pretty low bias current. Um, what are some drawbacks? Do we know what the magnitude of the bias current is going to be? And do we know its direction? And the answer is, you might know these things, but it's hard. They'll change with various things, such as the voltage of the inputs and also the um, temperature. They'll change with temperature. And um, it gets kind of messy to analyze the magnitude and direction of bias current into FET input op amps. Um, what we can rest assured is that if we know that it's a very small bias current, um, this, this is often good enough for most applications. And, and, we'll, and we'll talk briefly about how to, how to sort of compensate for, for bias current going into inputs, um, provided that you know that it's consistent. 
uh, that is sort of that you wouldn't want a case where bias current is flowing into the positive input, but out of the negative input, even though that, that could happen. You don't want that to happen. You'd like the, the bias current to be the same on both inputs so that you can compensate for it. So now that we've, do, now that we've sort of addressed the issue of, of bias current by changing the, the technology of our input stage, well, how do we deal with uh, the offset voltage? And uh, I mean, I think we're all familiar with offset voltage. Um, I guess it's kind of um, more like saying, you know, how everybody always says with op amps, the op amp wants to, you know, in a case of negative feedback, the op amp wants its input voltage on both of the inputs to be zero between them. That's not quite true. What it wants to see is the offset voltage between the inputs, which is, ideally you would have zero offset voltage. But the problem comes in the matching between the two transistors of the input stage. You know, if they're very well matched, you can get a low offset voltage. But usually we're talking on the order of like, like we said, it could be a millivolt or more, which can cause big problems. And so that's where we introduce something called the chopper stabilized amplifier. And they're also called zero drift or auto zeroing. And they're able to achieve really low offset voltage, which is great. And, and often they also feature um, fat input stages for low bias current. Um, so basically, so here's the input. I mean, there it is. That's the input circuitry, simplified input circuitry of a chopper stabilized amplifier. And it, it should be evident, you're basically getting two amplifiers for the price of one. Well, you'll pay for it, you know, in the sense that uh, they're usually more expensive, but you get two amplifiers for the price of one. Um, and so they operate in, in two different phases. And you can see I've drawn these red switches, these analog switches. I've drawn red ones and blue ones. Um, so what's going to happen is in the first phase, um, it's called the auto zero phase. Uh, amplifier B is going to sample its own offset voltage by just shorting out its inputs. Uh, and then it's going to effectively sample its own offset voltage. And it'll store that voltage on capacitor C1. Then the second stage is called the amplification phase. So now the red switch is open and the blue switch is closed. And so now C1 is, is like some feeding into, into amplifier B to null the offset voltage um, with, by just summing in or, or subtracting or summing either in a positive or negative fashion that sampled offset voltage. So now B can effectively sample whatever offset is occurring at the input. And it'll store that on capacitor C2. And then C2 feeds into amplifier A to null its offset voltage. And then there's going to be some kind of internal clock that is switching rapidly at some frequency between phase A and phase B. And in doing so, it, it nulls the offset voltage and effectively you know you can achieve very low uh, you know single microvolts even of offset voltage all right um so this you you know i mentioned a clock well that's kind of an issue right uh and it is the main thing to be careful of you get this something called clock feed through uh, because the clock is switching at some frequency between phase A and phase B, and it's switching. And, and oftentimes, if designers are clever, they will you know, make this clock uh, 
a sort of spe spread spectrum sort of thing where it's not a fixed frequency so that it can kind of spread out the, the switching noise across frequencies and make it a little less uh, periodic. But you know, the real solution is that you really want to add a filter if this noise is going to be too much for your application, depending on how sensitive your application is, it's maybe beneficial to add a filter to the output of your op amp, your, of your chopper stabilized op amp. But this has the problem of limiting the bandwidth. Uh, and you can see from this, like, Amplifier A and B, they may have a bandwidth of, you know, one megahertz. Um, but really the, and th this may be good enough, um, but the switching frequency between phase A and B is usually not, you know, more than a couple kilohertz. So really you're not correcting your offset voltage um, at a high bandwidth. So chopper amplifiers usually are not useful in high bandwidth applications. But that's the main thing I'd say there is to be careful of. So an application of a chopper stabilized amplifier would be, say, current sensing. What if I have, you know, some high current, you know, I haven't labeled it here, I should have labeled it. Let's say you have some rather high current going through a shunt resistor on the left, and you'd like to, maybe your shunt resistor is 0.5 uh, or half a milliohm, say, um, and you need maybe a, th uh, you know, you, you usually don't want your shunt resistor to be a large value because then uh, you have sort of a, this burden voltage. Um, you know, sometimes you can afford that, sometimes you can't. Um, so we'll, we'll imagine that we want our shunt resistor to be very low in value, um, also so that you don't get a high dissipation of power in your current resistor. Because if, you, if you're passing 10 amps through this thing and I power dissipated equals I squared R, you know, even if you had one ohm, that's a hundred watts. And that's, that's, you know, that, that resistor won't survive very long. So 0.5 ohms or 0.5 milli ohms, what, is, what does that give us at 10 amps? That's about 50 milliwatts, which is totally acceptable. Um, the other thing about power dissipation, even if your resistor could survive and not not burn up, uh, you know, the, once the resistor starts heating up, the temperature or sorry, the the value actually drifts with temperature, and that that introduces a new source of error uh, that you'd have to compensate for. But here we have, a very, this is like the most basic sort of sensing circuit that we could, that we could conceive of, um, where you have, you're gonna have R2 be something large and R1 will be probably small. And this will give you a gain of R2 over R1 plus one. And um, that will be V out. And you may ask a few questions like, well, what, practically speaking, what kind of values do I use for R1 and R2? Um, well, you really want them to be as low in value. In this case, you want those to be as low in value as possible. And that's mostly to reduce the amount of noise that's introduced into the circuit. So there's really two sources of noise. You're looking one at sort of in like bias current noise because you have this switched capacity well sort of you have this your bias current if, if we remember our chopper amp we're assuming this is a chopper stabilized amplifier so here you have this case where you've got these analog switches kind of switching between two amplifiers and th there's going to be current noise 
And so the, high, the higher your R1 is, you know, effectively the, the current, the impedance going into this amplifier uh, between, you know, the voltage that you're sensing and the input of the amplifier is approximately R1, assuming R2 is very large. Um, so the, the noise, the voltage noise is now amplified by a fact is whatever your current noise is times R1. So you, you'd really like R1 to be as small as possible. You're also worried about thermal noise or called Johnson Nyquist noise, where it, that's pretty much unavoidable. There's no way around it. Uh, just the fact that things are warm, they, it, it's, it's a complicated phenomenon, I guess, but you can kind of imagine, uh, you know, just larger value resistors uh, introduce higher uh, thermal noise into the system. So we'd like these R1 and for that matter R2 to be as small as possible. The other reason you may, the next question you might ask is why do we even have R1 up there? You know, what is that doing? Well, effectively, that's nulling out our bias current, or we're hoping that it will. Because let's assume, let's assume that we know the bias current is, say, 100 picoamps, and we know that it's going into the amplifier. Well, then the drop across R1 on the bottom. You know, the, for the low side sense, we know that that drop will be the same as the drop on the other R going into the non-inverting input. And so in that set, in that way, you can kind of, you can kind of get close to nulling out uh, some of that bias current. But there, there are other issues with doing that um, that I haven't addressed here yet. But this is a simple case. You know, uh, what if we wanted instead, instead of doing high, low side current sensing, what if we wanted to do high side current sensing? You may say, well, this is pretty easy. We just use a differential amplifier. And, and absolutely, you would use a differential amplifier. And we all know the equation for a differential amplifier is set up this way. Your V out is going to be your sense the voltage across the terminals, in this case, it's I load times R sense times R2 over R1. And so if R sense, like we said, if R sense is very small, like half a milliohm, um, then we need R2 over R1 to be a large gain. But there's a problem with this. There's a problem with this. What is what is the common mode voltage? You see, I've written on the left, our voltage source, I've called it V high. Uh, that's, that was to hopefully imply that that's a high voltage. I mean, what if that were, I don't know, 200 volts? Your op amp is not running on 200 volts. You know, it's, it's not running on 200 volts, common um, supply voltage. And so, you know, you know, this is not going to work for high common mode voltage uh, applications. You know, what we need is we need to somehow divide down, um, divide down our input and then gain it back up. Because we need a gain that's rather high. Like, you know, if we had, if we had half a milliohm and we're trying to sense like 10 amps, then we need a gain of probably about 100 to get it into like a zero to five volt range to sense 10 amps with that resistor. Um, so how are we going to do this? Well, here's a circuit that, we'll, that we could do this with. Um, I've, I've sort of simplified the left side, um, but the same parts are, are present with a few new parts. Um, so this now we've sort of complicated matters, it may seem, 
Um, so what is our, um, well, what, what values are we gonna pick for what is the first question. And what is our, um, what is our new function of, uh, of gain as a function of all this? Well, let's, let's try to clear things up. So there's our original. What if we redrew this a little bit as this? Does it become a little more clear now what, 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 we're, what we're talking about now? Now that I've redrawn it this way. I think this might be my last slide and I will continue this on a, on a drawing pen, a drawing on a whiteboard. Um, but I'll take a minute to think about this. Like now that we've redrawn it this way, is it kind of obvious what, what's going on now? Okay, let me switch to my drawing pad now. Um, so, So like we, we said, we've got our, you know, the voltage that we're trying to sense. E sig. And you've got a common mode voltage. D common mode. And I said there's, if we draw these each with like a resistive divider, okay, so we've got resistive dividers. And then we have our resistors doing the other thing. All right. So this is R2. This is still R2. And basically what we're what we're gonna do, each of these, you know, there's some voltage here. Let's call this voltage one. Let's call this voltage two. Voltage one equals common mode plus B sig. B two is B common mode. Okay. So no, I don't like that. What if we? Does everybody remember the the how to calculate the so-called feminine equivalent of a circuit. So let's recall what a feminine equivalent is. If we have, it gets complicated with more complicated networks, but if you have a voltage source and you have two resistors like so, the equivalent of this circuit call this V equivalent. And this will be R equivalent. Well, that's the equivalent circuit of this. V equivalent equals V times R2 over R1 plus R2. And R equivalent equals uh, it's one over R1 plus one over R2 inverted. So this should all be very familiar to anyone who's taken circuits, circuits one, but it's, it's, um, I would, if we rearrange this, I always forget how to rearrange it, but it, 
it's R1 plus R2 over R1, R2. That's right, yes. Yep, that's right, okay. Sorry, no, it flips, it flips around because it's, so it's R1, R2 over R1 plus R2. That's our equivalent. But you can you can compute it either way. Okay, so now that we know this, you know, each of these, each of these circuits, we have V equivalent one going through a resistor. And we have R equivalent one and R2. Next, we have V equivalent two and R equivalent two going through R2, and there's V out. Um, let me just shrink some of this. got very small. All right. Um, so remember that um, the, so if we remember this is R1 and this is R3, R1, R3. So we can compute very quickly R equivalent one and R equivalent two are equal. Why don't we just call them R equivalent because they're the same. R equivalent equals R1 times R3 or R1 plus R3. All right, and then you can see that we've taken and we've gained, we sort of divided down each of our voltages, both V1 and V2 have been divided down by some amount, right? So if we have V equivalent one, now equals say V1 over R3 over R1 plus R3 and V equivalent to oops, V2 times R3 over R1 plus R3. Okay. And so what we what we really want to know, well, well, then you take those voltages and so the the actual result that we're getting, you know, with this circuit here is V equivalent one my uh, let's just V equivalent one minus V equivalent two times R2 over R equivalent. That's V out. So now let's plug some things in. And I'll shortcut a little bit. Um, first of all, also I'm gonna move some stuff a bit so we can get some space. All right, so move this a bit. So I'm going to factor those out. V1 minus V2. See, we can see how that happened, right? And now you have R2 
over R equivalent. Remember the R equivalent now, R1, R3 times one plus R3. Now we can see that things are starting to cancel. R3 cancels out there. This cancels out there. And suddenly we have V1 minus V2 times R2 over R1 is V out, which is originally, oops, which is originally what we wanted. That's the, the usual common mode amplifier equation. So R3 has disappeared out of the picture because we, we just used that as a divider resistor to divide down the common mode voltage. And then we used R2 to gain it back up. So if we, if we recall what we were looking at originally, I'd originally drawn it this way. And now we've just rearranged stuff. And so like magic, R3 goes away. And this is how you design a high common mode voltage uh, amplifier. And so you, if you, if you imagine that the common mode voltage, you see what you have to do is divide, how do we pick resistors, I guess, is the next question. Well, we know what we want. We, we want to start by knowing, you have to know what you want to divide V high down into because that's the highest voltage in your system. So you have to, if you're running off say a five volt supply, single supply, five volts in ground, you need to divide, what if V high is 200 volts? You've got to divide that down to R1 and R3 to get a maximum of five volts at 200 volts. And then you now you know what R1 and R3 is, so you just divide, design R2 um, to be whatever it needs to be. Now you can see that the problems here are that if R1 has to be like one mega ohm and you want 100 times gain, well, now R2 has to be 100 mega ohms. And um, did I mess something up? No, I think I didn't. Yeah, this is fine. So, so now we, you know, if your R1 has to be 100 mega ohms, R2 has to be 100 mega ohms. There's things, there's a couple things you need. The qualities of this amplifier, of this op amp, you need low bias current. Well, and that's less necessary because you're, you're, you know, R3 provides a low, a low impedance path to ground. So if, you know, this is, if you had, if you were sensing 200 volts common mode and you've got, you've got a hundred, um, well, I mean, not quite though, you know, that's, The point stands, you need a low bias current and you need a low offset voltage. Of course, the offset voltage is still only a function of the gain, but, but that's always nice to have. Uh, low offset. Okay, finally, to wrap up this lecture, I wanted to show an example of how I would implement uh, the analog front end of a, an AC power monitor. And the nice thing about this implementation is it's um, running off of a single supply, in this case, a single five volt supply. And then you can, uh, it does require that you generate sort of a, a mid supply voltage. In this case, I've got it as 2.5 volts. And using that as your uh, reference voltage, in a sense, instead of using ground, you're using uh, a mid supply uh, 2.5 volts. And you, that forms a potential divider with the 
the um, these input resistors that you see, and I've used I've drawn them as multiple uh, input resistors because running sensing mains voltage like this or something um, of this order of magnitude, it's a good idea to have uh, multiple resistors instead of just a single large resistor. You can use multiple um, somewhat smaller resistors. So you don't need a resist, a special resistor that's rated for the high voltage. Um, and this, this gives you a, a 10 times gain on the current sense. Um, and the voltage sense is, you can see is just a, a resistive divider uh, summed with the 2.5 volt reference voltage so that you can get that uh, mid supply biasing. And um, yeah, that's that's the uh, that's how I would implement the front end of a an AC power monitor. So I think that concludes this lecture. Um, I think there might be a part two to this lecture. We'll see. Um, but until then, thanks for thanks for uh, listening. <laughs>